Jesus in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 2. Now, in the original Hebrew, Leviticus, Leviticus is called Ve'yikra, Ve'yikra, and Yahweh called, and God called. Okay, the first words of the first chapter, as it were, in each of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, are the names of the book. <laughs> and the first words in Leviticus, the Lord called to Moses, Ve'yikra. But we're beginning in chapter 2, okay? The grain offering. Now when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and shall take from it his handful of its fine flour and of its oil with all of its frankincense. And the priest shall offer it up in smoke as a memorial portion on the altar, an offering by fire, a soothing aroma to the Lord. The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord by fire. Now when you bring an offering of a grain offering, baked in an oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour, mixed with oil, or unleavened wafers spread with oil. If your offering is a grain offering made on the griddle, it shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mixed with oil, and you shall break it into its bits and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. Now if your offering is a grain offering made in a skillet, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. When you bring in a grain offering, which is made of these things to the Lord, it shall be presented to the priest, and he shall bring it to the altar. The priest shall then take up from the grain offering its memorial portion, and shall offer it up in smoke on the altar as an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord by fire. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. As an offering of the first fruits, you shall bring them to the Lord, but they shall not ascend for a soothing aroma on the altar. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Also, if you bring a grain offering of early ripened things to the Lord, you shall bring fresh heads of grain roasted in the fire, grits of new growth, for the grain offering of your early ripened things. You shall then put oil on it and lay incense on it. It is a grain offering. The priest shall offer up in smoke its memorial portion a portion of its grits and its oil with all its incense, and its offering by fire to the Lord. Now when most Christians I've met read that, they say, so what? Why all this detail? What the things for ancient Israel mean for us? Jesus fulfilled the law, he fulfilled the Torah, and that's just something... It's in the book, but we don't really need to read it or consider it. That's what most Christians have been conditioned to think. There are even churches that teach people such things. But what does the New Testament tell us? We always understand the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of the Messiah Jesus. Look with me, please, to the Epistle of Hebrews. Chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 10. Being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. Concerning him we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk, not solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He's an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. There's no chapter division in the original Greek text. Let's continue. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of instruction about washings, laying out of hands the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits also. Now notice what that's saying. The person of Christ who he is, okay, eternal judgment, repentance, faith, those things are milk. It was the Old Testament typology of Melchizedek, an Old Testament Christophany, appearance of Christ, that's meat. Most Christians have been given a diet of milk. To be perfectly honest, I know churches, that milk would be an improvement. They remind me of the Hindus I've seen in India who drink cow urine. I'm not joking. Milk would be an improvement. Milk is for babies. You got a baby. A time is going to come with that baby when that baby is a toddler and crawls around. And anything that that baby can get in his mouth, to him it's a cookie or candy or a biscuit, and he's got... His mother is going to have to hoover carefully, vacuum, see in English say hoover, vacuum carefully, and put everything where that kid can't reach it. Because if that kid can reach it, he can eat it. Or she can eat it. At least so they think. Their senses are not trained to discern the edible from the inedible. Christians who are only taught milk, basic doctrine, will not be discerning. They'll be suckers to eat poison. They will be prey easy prey to false doctrine because their senses are not trained. If you only know basic doctrine and the way things are today, basic doctrine will be an improvement. It will be a step forward in many churches. But if that's all you know, you're not going to grow beyond a limited point. What would happen when you wean a baby? You give the baby milk, okay, that helps calcify the bones. But without a protein diet, there's not going to be any muscle tissue on it. When you have a maldeveloped, undernourished child in the third world, one of the first things affected, of course, is the immune system. They become hypersusceptible to all kinds of infections. High infant mortality. No different with Christians. Okay, you give them milk that builds up the bones. If you give them the milk, today they let them have rickets. <laughs> You give them the milk. Where's the meat? The Hebrew word for meat is the same word for muscular tissue, basar. Greek is the same. Uh, same word. Uh, flesh. There's no flesh on the bones, no meat on the bones. You're only eating milk, not meat. And you're going to be swayed by false doctrine. It was the Old Testament typology, he says. That's the meat. Let's see. The one time in the outskirts of Charlotte, North Carolina, there was a guy who was a pretty good automobile mechanic. And he liked working on cars and he was good at it had a good aptitude for it, he was good working with his hands, he had a good reputation as a mechanic. But he wanted to go further in being a mechanic. So he quit his job in Charlotte, and he went to Caltech in California, 
to study automotive engineering. And the first day he goes in and they begin teaching him equations, mathematics. Why am I learning mathematics? This has nothing to do with auto automobiles. I didn't need this when I was a mechanic. Yeah, but now you want to be an automotive engineer. You're going to learn the equations that explain spontaneous combustion, that explain combustion theory, that explain ignited combustion. Those things have to be explained mathematically. And then your next class will be chemistry because you're dealing with fossil fuels. So you have to study organic chemistry, carbon chemistry, and mathematics. And then your next class is going to be physics. I didn't need to know this when I was changing carburetors. <laughs> Yeah, you were a mechanic, but now you want to be an automotive engineer. Once upon a time, on the outskirts of Raleigh, North Carolina, there was a paramedic worked rescuing people from automobile accidents on I-95 and Yankees going down ahead of Florida. <laughs> Pretty good paramedic. Saved a number of lives by tourniqueting, controlling bleeding, getting seriously injured patients to emergency rooms, to casualty, where they could cauterize, where they could operate. He was good at keeping these people alive who were hemorrhaging, who were caught up in these terrible accidents on the interstate. So this paramedic says, gee, you know, I like this. And he talks to a doctor, and a doctor says to him, you know, you really seem to have an aptitude for medicine. Why don't you go further? Why don't you go to medical school? So the paramedic quits his job and he goes to medical school. And the first thing they begin to teach him is that there are 20 amino acids left and right-handed, 19 and 1. And these amino acids can be used to form peptides in the right sequence. And these peptides will form polypeptides, and then you'll get chains of polypeptides to make one protein, an extremely long molecule for which there must be a coenzyme that's just as complicated. Why am I learning this? I didn't need this when I was a paramedic. Well, now you have to understand proteins like prothrombinase that make prothrombin that stops people from bleeding, the clotting factor. You have to understand how it's synthesized metabolically. You're not going to be a paramedic anymore. You want to be a cardiovascular surgeon. Hit the books, Jack. You understand? Policeman walking the beat decides they want to be a district attorney or a prosecutor. I go to law school. My children are both lawyers, Jewish lawyers. They want to sue me for damages. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't put them through embalming school. Well. So this police officer quits his job from the Raleigh Police Department and goes to law school. The University of North Carolina begins to learn corpus delecti, malum and say, no low contendere. Why am I learning Latin? <laughs> because Latin is a more exact language than English and legal terminology, that's why. I didn't need this when I was a cop. No, oh, man, you want to be a DA? It's no different than being a Christian. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Amen, amen, amen. I'm glad you drank your milk. Now it's time to eat the meat. Look with me, please, to Leviticus 2 once again. Most Christians have an idea that the Old Testament animal sacrifice, like the Paschal Lamb or the Yom Kippur scapegoat, are types or shadows of the Messiah, of Jesus. Most of them pretty much know that, that these animals were pictures of what the Messiah was going to do. But most would not have any idea why grain, different grains, are offered. Jesus is the word made flesh. The logos in Greek made sarks. Logos made sarks. In Hebrew, the davar, davar Adonai, the davar made flesh, basar. Okay? The book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew is called Dvarim, Dvarim. These are the things, the things. What's the word of God in Hebrew? It's the Dvar. What do you mean? It's the, it's the thing. In Hebrew, the word of God is the thing. Well, what is it? Well, it's the thing. We'll have a little Hebrew lesson. Davar, the Davar, the Bar Adonai, the word of the Lord. Same root as the Hebrew ledaber to speak. Ledaber being there, the same in Hebrew. Davar Adonai, Davar. The book of Deuteronomy, Dvarim. The book of the things. The word of God's the thing. Okay. Davar. The Hebrew word for honey. The bash. The bash. Same root. What is the shortage? Davash. Who makes honey? Bees. The water. The girl's name, Deborah, means bee. No girl named Deborah, the name means bee, the water. The water, the bees make the honey. Why is it like that? Look at Ezekiel chapter 2. He eats the word. The word was sweet like honey. Revelation chapter 9. He ate the word. Remember he ate the scroll? It was sweet in his mouth like honey, but bitter in the gut. When we eat the word of God, when we eat it, Spiritual food, it's always sweet in the mouth. Mmm, isn't that encouraging? Mmm, isn't that interesting? Mmm, isn't that fascinating? Mmm, isn't the scripture an amazing book? Mmm, sweet, yeah, it's always sweet. Oh, peptic Now I'm responsible to live it out in my life. You understand? It's always sweet in the mouth and bitter in the gut. Jesus is the word.
While the animals represent the physical death of Jesus as the lamb or as the scapegoat, the grain is the word of God. You understand? We eat it. Remember the manna that fell? Manna. Manna in Hebrew. What is it? What do you mean what is it? It's manna. It's what is it? Hebrew's funny that way. It's the thing. But what is it? What do you mean what is it? It's what is it? Remember it was flaky with honey? Taste? So, when you see the grain, it has to do with Jesus as the word incarnate, as the word, okay? Remember, Jesus Jesus is the scripture incarnate. The scripture is Jesus in print. The scripture is Jesus in print. If somebody loves Jesus, they'll love the scripture. If somebody does not love the scripture, they don't love Jesus Christ. They have a religion, but not a relationship. If you really love Jesus, you will love the word. If you love me, keep my commandments. The word that I've spoke, the word, he is the word. I remember during the counterfeit revival some years ago from Toronto and Pensacola. And you show people, wait, the fruit of the spirit of self-control, it says it twice in the New Testament in Greek. Not being out of control, and I saw people, oh, I couldn't control it, it must be the Lord. If the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, that can't possibly be the Lord. <laughs> and some of them actually said things like, God is bigger than his word. It says in Isaiah, well, it says in Psalms also, that God has magnified his word above his name, the essence of his being. Not only that, Jesus is God. The scripture is Jesus in print. How can God be bigger than God? They are not giving a theologically cogent argument. They're giving you emotionally charged religious stupidity running on cliches they imagine to be doctrine. That whole thing in Bethel, California, the IHOP, all of them do this. Open two windows. Throw the Bible out one, throw your brain out the other. There's no critical thought. And there's no examination of things by the standards of God's word. So this is the grain. And the grain is Jesus as the word. It was sacrificed three ways. It was sacrificed on an open fire. Here in Leviticus 2. On a grill. Everybody could see it. Then it was sacrificed in a skillet. The Levitical priest would have a skillet at the end of a long pole and he'd go like this over the fire. And then it was sacrificed, we're told, in Hebrew, betanora, inside an oven. It was burning up, but you couldn't see it. Why is it that the grain had to be offered sacrificially as a type of Christ, visibly on the grill, semi-visibly, in the skillet, and invisibly inside the oven? We are tripartite beings. We are made in God's image and likeness. 
Darwinism says we are bipartite. We're simply monkeys with better DNA. Well, I didn't used to be a Darwinist. I couldn't see any evidence for the transmutation of nucleic acids across the genus barrier in the natural environment, but I realized I was mistaken. There is proof for Darwinism. Anybody who believes that stuff must be related to a monkey. <laughs> we are tripartite. A body, a soul, and a spirit. We have a body because Jesus does. Because God does. The Son, prepare thou a body for me. Even in the Old Testament, Christophanes. Okay? The captain of the host that Joshua saw was Jesus. God walking in the garden with Adam, that was the Lord Jesus. The angel of the Lord, Hamalak Adonai, is Jesus. Okay? Melchizedek, Jesus. Okay? We have a body because God does. Prepare thou a body for me. We have a spirit, because God does, the Holy Spirit. And we have a mind, a soul, because God does. Who has known the mind of the Father? Tripartite, the magical day he brings, okay? Know ye not, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. The temple can be thought of as a building and a building and a building. Or it's a, a box in a box in a box. Our physical body Greek soma Hebrew goof that's the outer court of the temple. You're a temple of the spirit. The holy place, the soul, the mind, okay? In Greek, psuche, where you get the word psychology, <laughs> okay? In Hebrew, it's different. It's what we call in English, Anomanopia, nephesh, it sounds like what it is, breathing. <sighs> nephesh, <sighs> God breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. <sighs> nephesh, okay. soul. Okay. Then there's the innermost man or woman, Sometimes in the New Testament, represented by the cardio, the heart, in the Old Testament, by the kliot, the kidneys. <laughs> in Old Testament terms, you'd ask Jesus into your kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit. Okay. In Hebrew, ruach. In Greek, pneuma as in pneumatic drill or pneumonia, okay? A box in a box in a box. Only the high priest could go in there. For instance, what is the difference between demonic possession and demonic oppression? For a Christian indwelled by the Holy Spirit, if they're walking with the Lord, there can be no possession. Christians cannot be demon-possessed if they are real Christians. Walking with Jesus, they cannot be demon-possessed. But they can be oppressed. When somebody is possessed, the Greek word for dealing with the problem is balo. We get the word ballistic. To cast out or to shoot out. Okay. If somebody is oppressed, it's not the spirit. They're being oppressed either physically or emotionally or both. The word there is therapeo. Get the word therapy. P 
people are healed from demonic oppression. They are exercised or <laughs> cast out from possession. No place in the New Testament, no place does the New Testament teach casting out demons from a saved believer. Can believers be demonically oppressed? They can. Paul was. Can they be possessed? Be careful of these deliverance ministries that telling you this stuff and cast a demon out. These are people who don't want to deal with the realities of their need to pick up the cross and follow Christ, live a spirit-filled life to deal with their problems. There's an element of that in all of us. They think they just get the demon cast out. It's going to. It's like taking a pill for a headache to them. It's not like that. Okay. You see these deliverance. Do what I do when you see a deliverance ministry. Pick up the phone, give them a call. You have a deliverance service tonight? Yes. Send over two cheeseburgers, the raw onions. Don't forget the coleslaw. <laughs> so why is the grain offered? Three ways. On the grill, it corresponds to the body, the physical suffering of Jesus. Everybody could see the grain being burned up on the grill. It was his physical suffering. The first time the Dead Sea, um, the first time the uh, Shroud of Torwin was investigated, in France they kept corpses artificially respirating on light, on light support machines, and they cru they were brain dead, of course, but they crucified the corpses Roman style to, and then did autopsies, post-mortems on these cadavers to see what killed Jesus. And Jesus died from a combination of, it was mainly hypovolemic shock that killed Jesus. A terrible way to die. He basically, the diaphragm couldn't expand and he suffered a combination of pericardial effusion and a hypervolemic shock. You couldn't imagine a crueler way to kill somebody. When he was on the cross being tortured in our place, the wrath of God was being poured out on him. The reason Paul says we are not appointed unto wrath is because the wrath due us was poured out on Jesus in our place. This, of course, is denied by many people today professing to be Christians. One of the people who denies propitiation or substitutionary atonement, one of the people who denies it is William B. Young, author of The Shack. That man, by his own profession, is not a Christian. You got a copy of The Shack? Do yourself a favor. Put a match to it. The body. That's the grain on the grill. In the skillet. That was what the scriptures call the travail of his soul. Remember, the Levite had the skillet on the end of a pole like this. The people could see some of what was happening, but they couldn't see all of it because they couldn't look down into the skillet. When a believer is suffering emotionally, other people can see some of what they're going through but only some of it. Only he who looks down from above sees all of it. God knows what you're going through. Other people can only see some of it. Okay? This is the travail of his soul. But then something else happened. Inside the oven, betok hatanor, the spirit. The eternal oneness of the God's head had an Interruption, a hiatus. When Jesus took our sin, he was cut off from his father and gave up the ghost. Now be careful. This happened on the cross. He said, it is finished. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. The money preachers like Copeland and Hagen and Joyce Meyer in her first book teach Satan got the victory on the cross. 
Jesus descended into hell, was tortured three days and three nights in hell, then Jesus needed to be born again in hell. Then he was resurrected. This is a complete bastardization of the, of the gospel. It is totally corrupt. The spiritual death of Jesus occurred on the cross. Now how, in the eternal oneness of the Godhead, can it be interrupted? We don't know. We just know it did. We can't minimize the physical suffering of Jesus or the psychological torment of Jesus. But the worst was when, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There was a severance within the Godhead itself at that point of time where he took our sin to give us his life. Okay. So the grain had to be offered on grill, skillet, and oven. All three. Here's the word. Let's continue with Leviticus 2. You put oil on it and frankincense on it. A handful of flour with its oil and with all of its frankincense. What is this speaking of? Remember in Leviticus and in Revelation, the incense is the prayers of the saints. Leviticus chapter 8, Revelation chapter 8. Well, the angel took the censer. It was the prayer of the saints. What was the, the, the fragrance that went up to God? It was the prayer of the saints. What was the incense when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross? What was his prayer? Father, forgive them. <laughs> that was an aroma so soothing that God himself could not resist it. That incense was such a soothing aroma in the heavenlies that God himself could not resist it. The incense is the prayer. Everybody understand? Prayer, we're told in Revelation Ezekiel that incense is prayer. The Magi bought Jesus gold because he'd be a king, myrrh because he would die, but they bought him incense because he'd be a priest. We can say more about that in a moment, perhaps if we have time, but I better move on. Now let's look at the oil. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 30. Sorry, Exodus chapter 30. I'm beginning to lose my marbles. Verse 22. I don't have any notes with me, just going by memory. Verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take for yourself the finest spices of flowing myrrh, 500 shekels, and a fragrant cinnamon half, as of the 250 and a fragrant cane of two. Okay. 250. And of cassia, 500 according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, a hin. You shall make these holy anointing oil a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. 
It shall be holy anointing oil. Okay? Notice holy. Holy means set apart by God. Okay? Now let's look at verse 34. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take for yourself spices, stockte, onica, galbanum, spices with pure frankincense. There shall be an equal portion of each. The incense had to be made according to the prescribed recipe. It was equal portion of each. Unscriptural worship. Remember the sons of Aaron, they burned strange fire? God smote them? Strange fire is idolatry in Hebrew. It's the same term, avodah zerah. In other words, idolatry does not begin by worshiping other gods. It ends with worshiping other gods. It begins by worshiping the true God in an unscriptural way. Once Israel began worshiping Yahweh on the high places, it was only a matter of time before they were worshiping Baal on the high places. Unscriptural worship is idolatry is the same term in Hebrew. I once heard a preacher say in Northern Ireland, from Northern Ireland, there's no doxology without theology. In other words, unless the doctrine is right, God does not accept the worship. You have a hymn, a song, a chorus. Are the lyrics scriptural? Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. You've got people singing these 711 choruses. The Hill Song from Australia, I was just in Australia a week before last, is saturated with this stuff. The lyrics are not scriptural. Uh, it, it's the wrong mixture. God does not accept it as worship unless it is the right recipe, the right proportions. A lot of it is simply manipulation. You see people singing the same 11 words seven times, the 7-11 choruses, the same seven words 11 times, 7-11. That is not worship, that is a mantra, like in Hinduism. We are told in the New Testament, we're commanded, don't do that. Don't repeat these empty phrases like the heathen do. It's a mantra. It mesmerizes people and predisposes them to psychological manipulation and spiritual seduction. It is not scriptural worship. Again, different people have different tastes of music, but one thing I can tell you, traditional hymns like Charles Wesley and Isaac Watts and Fanny Cosby, you can be sure the lyrics are all scriptural. <laughs> when well, you sing from the Psalms, you can be sure that the lyrics are scriptural. You sing Hillsong, you can be pretty sure they probably aren't. But that's the way it is. What you have today is entertainment masquerading as worship. You understand? What used to be the Christian music ministry is the Christian music industry. It's based in Nashville, Tennessee, and in Sydney, Australia, mainly. Most of these Recording companies, gospel recording companies are secularly owned. It's a business. They're running a business. They call it a ministry, but it's a business. Okay. What are they doing? Look at verse 37. The incense which you shall make is holy to you. You shall not make it in the same proportion for yourselves. In other words, they're really not worshiping the Lord. They're worshiping themselves. You know how many worship leaders in churches are failed pop stars? They couldn't make it in the secular music industry, so now they're going to use their lack of talent for the Lord. It's entertainment. They're performers. <clears throat> not all of them, but most of them. That's what it's become. The oil is the same. You shall not make the oil to perfume yourself. It is holy unto you. Holy. Mekudesh lacha to a female. Mekudesh lach. Pay attention. The Hebrew term for getting married is to make holy, sanctify. 
You say, you stand under a hoopah in a Jewish wedding, and you say to your bride, Ani mekudeshet lak im atabat zug hidat Moshe ve'Israel. With this ring I wed thee according to the laws of Israel. Then you step on a glass. That's the last time you ever put your foot down. But anyway. <laughs> God made Kudesh. He sanctified this man to this woman, this woman to this man. Would you want somebody committing a adultery with your wife or your husband? No. Why? Because God has sanctified them to you. You understand? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Pay attention. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Okay? Um, only the high priest who was made Kudesh, set apart by God, could enter the Holy of Holies, okay? Marital consummation is physical, it is psychological, and it is spiritual. At least for believers, it's supposed to be, okay? But only the person who's made Kudesh, before the high priest could go on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, into the Holy of Holies, he had to undergo a ritual called Me Kudesh. Same word as a wedding. God sets him apart to go in. The Hebrew idiom for consummating a marriage is Niknas Ba, and he went into her. And the Lord allowed her to conceive, okay? Niknas Ba. If anyone, go, <laughs> your wife's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Hymen membrane is like the Vilon, the temple, the Mechitzat. If anyone other than the one who is Mekudesh, sanctified, set apart by God, enters that temple, God's temple is defiled. You understand? The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. It's like defiling God's, adultery is like defiling God's temple. It is only the high priest who can go in. Now in Greek the word is ganasko, to know intimately, or almost, yeah, supernaturally almost, ganasko. In Greek it's ladat, ladat. You can know and you can know. You can know intellectually, objectively, and you can know experientially. For instance, any Jew could read the Torah and know what was in the Holy of Holies, the Decalogue, the Holy Ark, the Showbread, whatever. Any Jew could know what was in there. But only the one who was made Kudesh, only the high priest, was to know what it was like to go in there. You understand? Anybody can get a, a, a textbook of Gray's Clinical Anatomy and you can look at microslides of fallopian tubes and ovarian tissue all day long. Anybody can know what's in there. But only the person who was made Kudesh, set apart by God, is to know what it is like to go in there. Okay? Everybody understands? This is heavy. Think of somebody other than the high priest going into the Holy of Holies. Whenever that happened in Scripture, it's a type of the Antichrist. It's a type of the Antichrist setting up the abomination. Remember that one king did it? He got leprosy. And he just, Pompey, the Roman general, did it. Anytime somebody, of course, Antiochus, anytime in Scripture or in biblical history, when somebody went into the Holy of Holies other than the Mekudesh, the high priest, it's a type of the Antichrist. It's serious stuff. Think of somebody sexually violating your wife or being one flesh with your husband. Would you like that? Of course you wouldn't. Why? Because God has set her apart to me. Because God has set him apart to me. When you see people putting the oil on somebody else, it is the same sin. It is holy unto you. Your anointing is your anointing. Somebody may have the gift of evangelism. We're all witnesses, but we're not all evangelists. We can all fish with a pole, but we cannot all fish with a net. Some people can preach the gospel to a large crowd, but we can all share our faith one-on-one. -on -one. 
But if you had an evangelist lay his hand on you, hands on you, he cannot transmit his gift to you. That's holy unto him. That anointing, the mishcha, the oil, holy unto him. Jacob Prash has the gift of teaching. I can't lay my hands on you and convey the gift of teaching. It's holy unto me. When Elijah was raptured, he couldn't take the mantle from, he couldn't give the mantle to Elisha. It had to fall to him from the chariot. It's not ours to give. It's holy. You cannot transfer an anointing. Everybody understands. Leviticus 2. That's why it's important. Let's continue. What's given to the high priest is most holy. We know from Hebrews the Aaronic high priest is a type of Christ. When you give money to somebody in full-time missionary, a full-time pastor, a full-time evangelist, a full-time missionary, that is most holy. It's like the high priest going into the temple. It's not just holy, it's most holy. Not just Kodesh, it's the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies. But those who work hard at preaching and teaching the Word of God be worthy of double honorarium. Why should you go to work where you work in a factory or a farm or a hospital or an office to survive and to pay your taxes and all the rest of it? and support somebody who doesn't work as hard as you do. Now, honest pastors work very hard, and they're grossly underpaid, and they're attacked by the devil more than other people. But you see these guys stand up week after week? I'm just going to share what's in my heart. You know what they mean. I don't have anything in my brain. Go get an honest job. They don't study to show themselves approved. If God doesn't approve of them, we shouldn't either. That money is most holy. He represents Christ as our teacher. But let's look. It goes on. Verse 11, no grain offering you bring shall be made with leaven, not over any leaven or any honey. Leaven has to do with sin in biblical typology, particularly the seminal sin, which is pride. Remember what Paul says? The yeast only puffs up. It contributes nothing to the nutritional value of bread. It only puffs it up. Matzah, Unleavened bread is striped and pierced. You've seen it, yes? By his stripes who you're healed is pierced for our transgressions. The rabbis know it corresponds to the flesh of the Paschal Lamb. John 6 would support the same view. Okay. The only one of us with anything to be proud of is, is Jesus. <laughs> he was God. We have nothing we haven't received. You're good looking, you received that. You're intelligent, you received that. You're successful in business, you have a good mind for business, you've received that. You've got good health, you've received that. We have nothing we haven't received, especially salvation. There's only one thing any of us have good reason to be proud of, and that's Jesus. We should be proud of Jesus. But in and of ourselves, we have nothing to be proud of. We all have many things to be ashamed of, but nothing to be proud of, except him. Yet the only one who had reason to be proud, there was no leaven in the matzah. He had no pride. He allowed himself to be publicly humiliated by Romans, rejected by the religious authorities of his own people, publicly humiliated, tortured, there was no leaven. 
Leaven represents pride, the seminal sin. You see a person with a problem with greed, under that greed is pride. You see a person with a problem with unrighteous anger, under that is pride. You see a person with a problem with recurrent lust, under that lust is pride. Pride is the sin that begets other sin. It was Satan's first sin. According to Isaiah 14, he wanted to be God. It was man's first sin. You can be like God. Pride is the seminal sin that begets other sin. There was no leaven in the matzah. Neither was there any honey. Remember, it was sweet. It was deprived of its sweetness. One day we'll enter a land of milk and honey. During the millennial reign of Christ, everything's going to be sweet. Honeycomb milkshakes for everybody. It's going to be great. In the meantime, sometimes it's sweet and sometimes life is bitter. But anyway, there was no honey on the matzah. Why? Honey speaks of the things for which we have natural affection. Look with me, please, to Proverbs. Chapter 24, verse 13. My son, eat honey, it's good. Yes, honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. We all need affection. The scriptures, for instance, speak much more, much more of a father's love than a mother's love, parentally. Yet there are fathers, and even sometimes Christian fathers, who've never hugged their children. You're depriving the kid of honey. Don't do that. But then there's the other side of the coin. Verse 27 of Proverbs 25, Proverbs 25, 27. It's not good to eat much honey, nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. Too much honey will make you sick. Be careful of Christians who are ruled by their affections, who think with their emotions instead of their brains and imagine it to be the Holy Spirit. This is ridiculous, but it happens. I've seen people believe crazy doctrines that are dangerous. Oh, but we just have to love. Where did Jesus ever compromise truth in the name of love? In Philippians 1.9, it says that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and discernment. If there's not doctrinal knowledge of the word of God and discernment, love will not abound. Not agape love, not real love. A stupid, emotionally charged, religious counterfeit will abound. Emotional religiosity will abound. That ignorant Christians, carnal Christians, imagine to be spirituality. But love will not abound. Look at Jesus with the woman at the well. He was so open and loving with her, but as soon as she began with her false doctrine, you Jews have that mountain in Jerusalem, we have Mount Zion, we have Mount Gerizim. Before he went any further in the conversation, he told her, lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation comes from the Jews. Your religion is not right. Or the Syrophoenician woman, in the Greek it's diminutive. It's like puppies, not dogs. Please help my little girl, she's demon-possessed. Jesus says, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. Sounds like a racist statement. What Jesus is saying is, you have a pagan religion. It's unfit for human consumption. Then he helps a little girl. Jehovah's Witness beliefs are unfit for human consumption. Mormonism is unfit for human consumption. Roman Catholicism is not fit for human consumption. Islam is not fit for human consumption. It's for dogs, not people, made in the image and likeness of God. It is dog food. 
He never compromises truth in the name of love. Oh, we just have to love. My family's a mixture of Catholic and Jewish. I know people who love Israel and the Jews so much that they don't tell them the gospel because they don't want to offend them. Oh, we love you. We love Israel. We love the Jewish people. Thank God for that. But I don't want to tell them that they have to believe in Jesus or they're going to hell. I love you, Jew. Go to hell. <laughs> My wife's family were all murdered in the Holocaust. Wife... It was horrible that my family, my grandfather, and so on, were murdered by people claiming to be Christians in the Holocaust. But a bigger tragedy was they didn't know Yeshua as their Messiah when they murdered them. And I have Catholic family. Oh, I know Catholics are wonderful people. So what if they believe that they have to pay for their own sin in purgatory? So what if they don't believe the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin? We'll just let them on their deathbed die in fear with rosary beads, praying to Mary and calling on the dead because they don't have the assurance of salvation because we love them. Don't tell me you love Catholic people. Bold, you can approach the eternal throne. They can have the assurance of salvation. His blood cleanses from all sin. But Roman Catholicism says if you profess that, you've committed the sin of presumption. So you let the Catholic person die in superstition and believing a false gospel that you have to pay for your own sin. Because you love them? That's not love. That's sick. That's dog food. But they think with their emotions. Their affections. We, I know we're in the South, there's not many Catholics. Do we have any Catholics here? Any former Catholics? Am I telling the truth about Catholicism? Yeah. Except for New Orleans and that, you don't have a lot of Catholics in the South, but there's some. Well, let's look. Don't eat too much, honey. Oh, don't smack little Henry. Henry's a good boy. So the police come to the door at four in the morning with little Henry, and he's not so little anymore, and he hasn't been so good. Should have corrected him when he was seven. Nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. When you see these Christians who are emotionally charged and ruled by their affections and imagine it to be spiritual, they are seeking their own glory. They are not seeking the glory of God. They are ruled by their affections and they are trying to lift themselves up to imagine themselves to be spiritual. Too much honey. Too little? No good. Too much? No good. Human intellect, the soul, good servant, bad master. Human emotion, good servant, deadly master, deadly master. As this was a medical missionary in Mexico, Naomi, inoculating the little kids for diphtheria. The directions hurt them. She'd hold out a lollipop, and when they reach for the lollipop, she'd jab them. And then they'd scream, ah! They don't comprehend that she just may have saved their life. How can you be so cruel and hurt children? <laughs> you can't think with your emotions. If somebody thinks with their emotions, they shouldn't be in any medical profession. It shouldn't be in law enforcement. You can't do that. Good servant. Compassion, good servant, deadly master. Well, ministry is the same. Compassion, emotion, good servant. Dangerous master. Let's continue. We're almost finished. So you got the grain. No honey. Quite a thing. I had a very pretty girlfriend. She was a Jewish girl, half Jewish, in New York. And one of the things about 
being a Christian is there's more Christian women who are unmarried than men, so even ugly guys like me could get good-looking girlfriends because they want to marry a believer. And she was a professional, had been a professional dancer. She was drop-dead gorgeous. And uh, I liked her and everything, but, uh, you know, uh, marriage is another thing. I'd already, you know, had been a fornicator and so on, and I wasn't going to... The only good thing about marriage to me was sex wouldn't be a sin, and that wasn't a good enough reason to jump off the Empire State Building without a parachute. I I wasn't. I knew I was in trouble one day when she called me up, and she said, Hello, honey. I immediately immigrated to Israel. (laughs) I married an Israeli girl. She doesn't call me honey. I'll tell you what she calls me later. But anyway, (laughs) you think I'm joking? (laughs) No, honey. An offering of the first fruits you shall bring, but they shall not ascend for a soothing aroma on the altar. What does that mean? The first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. We have to make more progress. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. The resurrection is proliptic. On the Hebrew feast of first fruits, Yom Rishon of Hagmatzot after Passover, Sunday morning, the high priest goes into the Kidron Valley when it's dark. He waits for the first pin of light to come up on the east and back of the Mount of Olives. When he sees it, he ceremonially harvests the first stalk of grain coming out of the earth. That's the first fruit. The very hour of the very day, remember all four Gospels say that Jesus rose at dawn when it was still dark. The very moment the high priest was harvesting the first fruit, Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection. Very moment of the very day. Again, they're holding all the cards, but they don't know how to play the hand. Unless they get saved and the veil falls off. Well, let's look. First fruit. You can bring it to the Lord, but you can't burn it. The Messiah dies once. We are told once in 1 Peter chapter 3, and no fewer than six times in the epistle to the Hebrews. He was the perfect sacrifice. He dies once and for all. We don't need a priest who sacrifices again, again, and again. It's once and for all. Don't bring that grain to the altar and sacrifice it again for the first fruits. He's, he's risen. You understand what Roman Catholicism does? It says the Mass is the same sacrifice as Calvary. They put him back on the cross. It's called the crucifix. <laughs> the problem with the crucifix is the wrong person is on it. It should be a little statue of us that's on it. Pick up your cross and follow me. He's risen. We're the ones who need to crucify our old nature. (laughs) The doctrine of the Mass is that Jesus continues to die sacramentally. It is fundamentally a rejection of the true gospel. Now, we can say a lot more about the Mass, but that's why the grain offering can only be offered when he dies once and for all. It is perfect. Um, Maybe we'll just look very, very quickly at Hebrews. We've got to get out of here. I'm driving you guys nuts. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Every priest stands daily ministering, offering time after time the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. Okay? Once and once and for all. Uh, Hebrews 9, verse uh, 13. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without blemish, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living thing? We don't need somebody who has to keep on dying. Okay? Keep, keep on dying. Uh, it's, it's also in Hebrews 7, uh, verse 27, who does not need daily like those priests 
to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then the sins of the people. That was the Meit Kudesh. Because this he did once and for all. He is perfected for all times, Hebrew says, those who are being saved. If something is perfected, it's perfect. You cannot improve on perfection by definition. The Roman church says, no, Calvary was not good enough. You have to have the mass and keep doing it. Roman Catholicism is a different religion. It is the pontifical religions of pagan Rome masquerading as Christianity. It's not scriptural. Are there true Christians of the Catholic Church? If they are, and there are, the Holy Spirit's going to show them to get out of it. I would never say there are not true believers in the Roman Church. And you know what? Liberal Protestantism is even further away. Nominal Protestantism is even further away. Are there true believers in it? Yeah. But the Holy Spirit will show them to get out. Go find another church. Just think about it. The, the president, J.D. Greer, the Southern Baptist, said that we as Christians have to become the number one spokesman for homosexual, lesbian, transgender rights. It's just the Southern Baptists. They used to be Christian. Once and for all. Okay. Well, we end every grain of offering of yours seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. Salt is the preservative. Even in modern food science, things like sodium benzoate, they're all salt-based. It preserves. This grain will preserve a Christian. It will preserve a marriage. It will preserve a family. It will preserve a church. It will preserve a union of churches. It will preserve a society. It will preserve a nation. You go away from it and the salt loses its taste, Jesus said. It's good for nothing but to be trampled under foot. Well, finally, bring the offering of whole grain and crushed grain. What's the difference between whole grain and crushed grain? When you read the scriptures for yourself, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. You pray, you talk to God, you read his word, he talks back. What you're getting from me is crushed grain. You understand? I'm breaking up the word of God exegetically and making a cake that you couldn't do for yourself unless you're a teacher. I can give you crushed grain, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't eat the whole grain. The whole grain comes first. There are some great Christian books. Pilgrim's Progress. The screw tape letters. Okay. Fox's Book of Martyrs. There's some wonderful Christian books. Some wonderful crushed grain. But it doesn't take the place of whole grain. No Bible expositor, including the one you're looking at, can ever replace the prayerful reading of the Word of God for yourself. Oh, it is. A need for crushed grain. But there's a need for whole grain. By the grace of God, I can serve crushed grain. That's what we've done today. I hope. But you're home. And you're praying. And you're reading. That's the whole grain. You won't be able to digest the crushed grain, unless you first learned how to digest the whole grain. That is the grain offering. Thank you so much for listening. We'll continue tomorrow, Lord willing, at 7. To those who have to go home, I appreciate some of you have driven long distances from Virginia and Atlanta and so forth. God bless. 